Okay, so we're standing here at the super tall bag. Brian's gonna show me how to throw an effective punch. Hey, welcome to the Adler.tv show. I'm Chris Adler. I got a new episode every Thursday at 5 a.m. with a different guest in a different location. You can find all the episodes at my website, www.adler.tv. Today's guest is Brian Smith. He's the head jiu-jitsu instructor at Full Blast Dojo in Fosters, Alabama. That's where I met him to talk about his career in martial arts, the benefits of jiu-jitsu for law enforcement officers. We're going to talk about Bruce Lee's impact on martial arts and a ton more. I'm asking basic questions at times throughout this episode because I want it to be accessible to everybody watching or listening. And to start things off, I asked Brian to show me how to throw an effective punch. Check it out. What, are, what is the thought process here? Uh, just to make sure that you hit the bag properly, correctly, the right angle, and to make sure you get your hip in it and that your, that your hand is properly aligned when you strike the bag. Talk about that a little bit more. What does that mean, get your hip in it? Okay, so if you'll notice, uh, I'm, I'm using, I use my power side forward. I'm right-handed, I like to put my power side forward and fight kind of like a southpaw. So by getting the hip in it, what I do is first I make sure that I can't quite hit the bag when I extend my hand out. And so I'm gonna rotate my hip, mm. it gets to the bag. So now I'm putting nothing but hip into the punch right there. Okay. Okay, I like that little distance test there. So you get your hand there, and then once your body turns, you're making contact. Yep. Sweet. That's a cool test right there. Very practical, very simple, very easy. I like that. The same, and so then when you're following that up, we'll say a cross punch, okay? Like, so this is a jab. When I'm firing a cross, now I'm doing the same thing, getting my hip in it. I'm rotating my hip forward, and I kind of drop it down just a little bit to get the, to get the cross punch in, and firing straight out and straight back. So now my hip is generating force on both sides. And explain to people why why do you have to get your hip in it? What, what you know what I'm saying? I know why, but can you use it? All punching power, all every type of power, punching, kicking, tackling, grappling, everything comes from your hips. So uh, you know like for instance if, if in football when you tackle, you tackle the hips. That's what gets them down, right? When you punch, your whole body rotates based on the axis of your hips. Right? So if you're just punching with, if you threw a punch without using your hips in it, you're just using arms and you're using a whole lot of muscle. When you use your hips, you're using your skeleton, you're using your frame to make that punch, right? So that's the importance of getting the hip in it. <laughs> yeah, and I have seen that 100% um, in, uh, in the world of jiu-jitsu. If somebody's got you pinned down on the ground, you're on the ground, and you just try to bench press them up, just think of that. Think about that, bench pressing. I can maybe bench press my body weight, you know, right now. I don't really work on bench. It hurts my shoulders, that kind of thing. And I can maybe bench press my body weight right now at this point in my life, and I can squat with my whole body a lot more weight, you know, than that. And so when it's honestly just it's not sad but it's kind of funny when you're on top of somebody and they're trying to bench press you off of them and you're just like buddy you can extend that arm up but you're wasting a lot of energy and you're not you're, you're not doing yourself any favors plus you're also giving me your arm to you you know what i'm talking about <laughs> you get eaten up is right you called yourself a power forward meaning you're right-handed so you keep your right hand forward wow okay yeah okay and so you which effectively makes you a southpaw it does, yeah. Traditionally in boxing, you go with your with your weaker side forward, and fire, you know, like a twisting rotation type type of punch. There's nothing wrong with that. There's it's absolutely fine to do that. Um, What's up with the twist, the the wrist twist? I mean, you see, you see, you see karate people doing that like crazy all the time. Well, it actually began with the idea of cutting your opponent's eye. So when you twist, you're actually twisting and kind of cutting. That's why, obviously, there's Vaseline on the high points of the face. But a lot of folks don't know that. But back in the day, that's the reason why the twist was added in there. It has really almost nothing to do with power. Like I said before, power is oh. all hip. Oh. So you can get away with not turning your hand. You okay. can just go straight with it either way, either vertical or horizontal with your fist, right? So, but traditionally in boxing, you know, you're fighting with your weaker side forward. But that's because boxing is also, you know, based on points as well. So it's okay to just land a punch without having to exert a lot of force because the idea is, is to throw your stronger weapon, your, your uh, right hand, if you're right-handed, in the back where you can generate a whole lot of force in there. Crossing your body, crossing your body, rotating that body. Awesome, awesome. And yeah, so that's, that was, that's you know, traditional boxing, nothing wrong with that. Um, 
But in a street fight, you know, obviously, you, don't, you can't box. You need, you need to make the hardest punch you can on the first shot. And, it, and it's a myth that you need to put your power side to the back to generate more force. When you're using your hips, it doesn't matter which side you're going to. I'm throwing my hips the same way as I would right or left. So. Show me, um, so with your power, with your southpaw power front forward, show me one more time getting your hips into it um, with, that, with that jab. Okay, so again, when I'm working on the bag, I'm gonna make sure my hand's just maybe an inch or so away from the bag. So this way, when I, when I throw my punch, my hip's what's generating that force into it. And it doesn't take but just a small tweak to get that punch in there, just like that. Awesome. What's the thought process of, a, of an effective uppercut? Almost the same thing. This one's a little bit kind of low for me, but almost the exact same thing. So if I'm firing a straight uppercut, I am kind of, I'm turning my hip into it and bringing the hand up. Normally in, in, a, regular, in a regular uppercut, you're going more straight up with the punch. Yeah. A lot of people think it's a, a rising or kind of an arcing punch. It's really not. You want to punch more in a kind of a straight up motion. So when I'm throwing this, I'm doing the same thing. I'm putting my hip into it as I go. Nice. Yeah. Now let's talk about kicks. Uh, I know there's a lot of like rotation talk and again, it's, it's all hips. Am I right about that? Absolutely. It's always, it's always hips, especially with the legs, right? But like say in a, in a Muay Thai style kick, you don't just want to leg check or just, or just put an annoying type of kick to somebody's leg. You want to hit it and cut right through them. In Muay Thai, the idea is, is to chop down the tree, right? So when you're firing, the, when you're firing a kick, especially a, a shin kick, that's where you're going to need to really put your hip into the kick, right, and, put, and generate a whole lot of force. Okay, so if I am, and you said shin kick, meaning I am kicking with my shin. Yeah, I'm using my, the, the blade of my shin to land into the outside of your leg um, and hopefully hit the sciatic nerve and shut that nerve off and cause the opponent to drop or give up, right? <laughs> So yeah, yeah, it's so brutal. It's so brutal. My goodness, it's so brutal. Yeah, those Muay Thai leg kicks are just like you're. If you can place it, if you can place it in the right place, you see it all the time. Just people's, it, they're, they're just leg just stops working. It's just, it's amazing. So you are a jujitsu instructor. Yes. Currently, right now, but you have a, uh, you got a, a major rap sheet in. But not in a bad way, rap sheet. <laughs> <laughs> not, a, not a rap sheet. Um, we were actually talking about something else uh, before we started, and I used the word <laughs> rap sheet, so I think that's why that was in my head. But I'm going to read uh, some of the background that you've got going on here. You're the uh, 2011 inductee to the Martial Arts Masters Hall of Fame. You're a brown belt under Carlos Machado. You're a uh, full, uh, full instructor in Jeet Kune Do. You're the founder of Full Blast Martial Arts, where we are here now. Uh, you are a, a defensive tactics instructor for Air Force Security, of, uh, security Forces slash civilian leo you are trained extensively in filipino stick and knife fighting and you're a former assistant mma coach at headhunter combatives that is quite the rap sheet sir <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a lot <laughs> wow this rain i'm so glad i got here like it is pouring down oh, yeah. yep <laughs> i love the sound of it and i'll be able to cut it out too it won't we won't even hear it at all in okay. my podcast <laughs> which is pretty cool the cool. um the, the like one of the few things I'm good at is treating audio. Yeah. So that um, of course I say that now and it'll be like <laughs> as people try to listen to it. But uh, <laughs> so of that whole rap sheet, I keep calling it a rap sheet. <laughs> of that whole background that you sent me, um, tell me about the induction in 2011 to the Martial Arts Masters Hall of Fame. What is that? How did that come to be? Well, it came to be um, a friend of mine named Robert Parham. He's a, a former world kickboxing champion. I met him down in Biloxi, Mississippi around 1998, and uh, I got to train with him. I got to learn with him for about six or seven weeks. Uh, I was totally blown away by him. He and I just clicked like brothers, uh, went to a lot of events together, and we just stayed tight for years. And uh, he contacted me and he said, uh, we're getting you inducted into the Martial Arts Hall of Fame, and you're, you can't take no for an answer. So, <laughs> That's great, uh, man. Uh, he's, uh, he's connected with them. Um, has, he, you know, he's gotten a lot of people inducted, not just, uh, not just me, a lot of people. Yeah. Um, a lot of people that he felt was deserving, and then he would put it up to the board members and hear his uh, reasons for it and say, okay, yep, bring them in. And that's pretty much how that happened. Fantastic. So from here, does, what, what does that mean? Are you now um, involved in decisions that they make in the future, or you're just being honored by them? How does that work? What, what does that mean? Just, just being honored by them. Awesome. You know, uh, I can go to the events every year that they have it and, 
and uh, help take part in it. And I'm planning on hopefully going to one of the next ones here that come up. And it's like a, uh, it's like a thank you for being involved in MMA and, um, and spreading the good aspects of martial arts to people everywhere and, and all, and, and that kind of thing. Is that, Absolutely. is that what's up? Yep. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that most bullies, bad people, criminals, thugs, whatever you want to call them, they don't show up to places like this you know no they learn a few dirty tricks on the street and most of the time they're using weapons or whatever it may be and uh so a lot of people that aren't involved in this world don't understand what kind of people and what kind of relationships and why people do it like you haven't studied martial arts throughout your life because you want to hurt people Right, you know what I'm saying? Like right. that's uh, a lot of people miss that. A lot of people don't get that. So, yeah. um, and once again, I've said it a million times on the podcast, but jujitsu is just one of the most awesome things that I've had the pleasure of learning about in my life because of it teaches me to. In fact, I'm, I call my I have this thing where on my way home from jujitsu, I have a, a, a habit, and it's a good habit of calling my grandma one of my grand my, my grandparents on the way home i'm like all right dude you got to talk to your grandma you know you, you got to talk but by the way people if you're not talking to your grandparents call your grandparents okay they miss you they want to talk to you uh talk or, or your parents or whatever whoever it may be and so i'm always like hey how's it going they're like great are you, you are you driving home from your judo you know they usually call it judo or whatever <laughs> i'm like yeah yeah you know and, and my grandma asked me last night she was like why do you do that like why would someone want to do it and i was like well you know what it's so hard and difficult and at times scary, it kind of makes the rest of my life not as hard and not as difficult and not as scary. Right. Just in a nutshell, you know? And I, I know you'd probably agree with that. I do, 100%. Statement. All right, back to this uh, this rap sheet, as I'm stupidly calling it for some reason. <laughs> You're a brown belt under Carlos Machado. Yes. For the uninitiated, what does that mean? Um, well, you know, Carlos Machado is uh, the oldest of the, of the five Machado brothers, you know, John Jock, Hegan, uh, Johnny, and Roger. Um, and he's, uh, you know, cousins with all of the Gracies, with, you know, Hoyce and Hickson. And so he's a, a legendary uh, jiu-jitsu master. Um, thousands and thousands of people have trained with him, Chuck Norris. Um, and I guess just having the, you know, the honor and the privilege to, to have gotten all of my belts from Carlos and um, being able to get back in touch with him and uh, renewing my, my studentship under him, it, it, means a, it means a lot to me. And I know that everybody that trains with Carlos and even the ones who are just meet him and get to talk to him, they see what, a, you know, what an impact he has on people's lives all over the world pretty much. Yeah, he's a big deal. It, it, for those of the people who don't know, he's a very big, very, very big deal. The, the Machado family uh, could be compared probably almost to the Gracie family. Yes. Okay. That was a step out for me. That was a risky thing for me to say just then. I'm glad you said yes. <laughs> so, uh, you are a full instructor in Jeet Kune Do. Yes. I, I truly don't know what Jeet, Jeet Kune Do is. I'm, I should have researched it before coming here. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Jeet Kune Do is, is Bruce Lee's art. Okay. Yeah. Um, I studied that under a man named uh, Sifu Lamar Davis. He lives up in uh, Oneonta, Alabama right now. He used to teach in Alabaster and Bessemer and several places around Birmingham before he moved to Oneonta. I met him in 1995 and began my, began my formal study of Jeet Kune Do under him. Um, Jeet Bruce Lee, you know, he, he grew up studying a, an art called Wing Chun. And when he moved to America, um, he started formulating uh, probably a slightly more, I guess you could say, practical or, or useful form of Wing Chun to kind of match more his personal way of dealing with larger, stronger, faster opponents. Most of his students were karate guys, judo guys, wrestlers, boxers. And uh, so, so Bruce modified what he was doing, and he, and he kept modifying it until he kind of came up with a, I guess you would call a, a fine product, uh, closer to the, you know, around the mid to late 60s. And, uh, you know, just before his death, he was, he was always, like, refining and polishing until he had a, I guess, like I said, like a fine product there, you know, before he was, before he passed away. Yeah. And am I right in that Bruce Lee was one of the the guys to first start taking from different martial arts to, to, to take some of the more, like trying to get the effective moves from different martial arts to combine them into his own? Is that what Jeet 
Kundo came from, or is, is that not right? No, that, that's that's pretty correct. I don't think that Bruce was the first person, you know, to do it. I think he was probably the most popular person to do it. Okay. Um, back in you know back in the early to mid '60s, um, you know, it really it was kind of an unheard of thing. You either did you know karate or judo or boxing or wrestling, and Bruce was pretty much the first person to come out and say, you know, 99% of that is, is useless because it's, you know, you're, you're just looking at things one way. You yeah. Know, and, and most of it wasn't with full contact or with a resisting opponent. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and yes. in the air like you see people yeah. in karate classes doing that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 And Bruce was real big on contact, real big on incorporating boxing. He was a huge, huge boxing fan and probably studied the most uh, boxing type or, or boxing styles or boxing um, sweet, information. Yeah. Sweet science, baby. Yeah, sweet the science. sweet science. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Bruce Lee was a huge and avid fan and, and, and he loved everybody that boxed. And he, so he started putting that, he started, he's probably the first martial artist to use boxing gloves as, in sparring and saying, Hey, we have to go all out when we do this or else we're not doing it right at all. Mm. Um, and yes, Jeet Kune Do was comprised primarily of Wing Chun. That was Bruce Lee's nucleus, his core. Um, and he was introduced to a lot of other arts through some of his friends, uh, like a, a June Reed, uh, one of the grandmasters of Taekwondo, um, through Chuck Norris, uh, se- several several martial artists, and kind of combined it. Bruce is actually is kind of, in my opinion, the godfather of kickboxing because mm-hmm. uh, his one of his primary students was a kickboxer named Joe Lewis, and Joe Lewis uh, re- like logged more private hours training with Bruce than anybody ever did. And Joe always credited Bruce Lee with with his uh, his path into kickboxing. Let's talk about your work with the Air Force Security Forces slash civilian LEO. You are a defensive tactics instructor. Uh, what is civilian LEO? I, sh- I should know what that is. Law but... enforcement. Oh, it's law enforcement. Police. Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so what does that mean? What did you do? What does a defense tactics instructor for Air Force Security Forces mean? Um, pretty much throughout my entire Air Force career. I, I was in for 21 years. The, um, the security forces, which is basically security police, the, uh, the base protection, mm-hmm. um, they, before, I, before I became a, poli- a security police officer, I actually uh, was in a different career field. And I always taught classes, jiu-jitsu classes or Jeet Kune Do on base. And gradually the security forces members would find their way into my classes and they would ask me, you know, do you have anything specific that we can do like for weapons retention? Or for when we're in clearing rooms or if we're dealing with a suspect and, and they get physical with us, um, which I think needs to be specific other than just, okay, well, I'll teach you how to punch and kick. I'll teach you how to grapple. They need to learn how to deal with this, with, with their uh, encounters while they're carrying their gear, while they're wearing all this body armor and carrying guns. And so um, so I got real, real big into helping that and uh, had a lot of great students through it and traveled all over the world doing it. So pretty much every base I ever went to, I was the defensive tactics instructor for whatever security forces. And then when I became a security forces member, obviously I was the, the coach for that. Very cool. So how, how long have you been doing jiu-jitsu or studying jiu-jitsu? Since 1998. 98. Okay. Wow. That's fantastic. Um, and that shows when, and I hate to, to, to crap on some martial arts. Uh, but I do t- from time to time because um, because when I was when I was young, all the people at my school that did karate, there was a couple guys at my school that did karate and I could take them all, all, all of them. I could take them all. So from a very young age, I wrote off martial arts and studying martial arts. And I think that is what uh, I, I think a lot of times people don't understand that there are different martial arts and there are different approaches and there are different kinds of black belts. When you have a 14-year-old girl go to karate classes for a summer, and by the end of it, she's a brown belt in karate or whatever it may, whatever it may, it may be, um, that's just that's a cool accomplishment, and I'm glad that she's studying, and I'm glad that she's gaining confidence, and I'm glad that she's challenging herself, but let's not put all martial arts in the same categories, and let's not put all brown belts in the same categories. Uh Mr. Brian Smith right here sitting next to me has been studying jujitsu for 21 years and he is a brown belt still currently in jujitsu, not a black belt. So that tells you people that uh, there are levels here uh, and within the martial arts, there are different, different brown belts and different black belts and that kind of thing. So um, while, while I'm thinking about it, the, one of the things that frustrates me so much when it comes to law enforcement 
is that I, you see, and I've, I know you've seen the videos of police officers struggling with a suspect. The police officer is in danger. The suspect is is flailing around and 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 going to potentially hurt themselves. Definitely potentially hurt the police officer. And you just see, like, oh my goodness, with two simple jujitsu moves, this whole situation could be just squashed this whole situation could be uh nullified or what you know what i'm saying absolutely and 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 this and the the person wouldn't be hurt and the police officer wouldn't be hurt and you're just thinking dude this is your this is your your occupation this is what you go out and do every single day and i don't know who i don't i don't want to use the word blame but i don't know who to talk to and say why aren't you studying this like sh- sh- i mean should the you know the police departments themselves be spending more time training the officers in this or should it be up to the police officer themselves on their own time and their own dime to get this training to be you know to be better at uh handling handling you know people um controlling people uh what what are your what are your thoughts on that i I absolutely agree with you 100 percent. well and and to answer both those questions I believe that one that the police officers, if they if they take their profession seriously, and they want to be what I consider a, for, a, a force multiplier, that means being able to handle yourself without without needed backup. Um, oftentimes, when you get into a struggle with someone, you, you know you don't know how far it's going to go. Like you've mentioned, um, I believe every police officer should at least invest some time of their own to get into something, and if not necessarily just jujitsu, find somebody who can give them a crash course and, and walk them through it. May, maybe say, you know, here, wear your gun belt and try to get out from underneath this pin or, or, or um, try, to, try to keep control over your weapon while I try to get it. Um, and that's just one part. And I do believe that departments should make way more time for training. Unfortunately, a lot of times budgets don't always allow for that. Um, some departments are more fortunate than others when it comes to that, and some are a lot more progressive thinking, like you mentioned. Um, Yes, I believe it should be both. I believe departments should should make it a mandatory, not just a, a one hour or two hour class in, inside it, but it needs to be a week long or two weeks long, however it takes to get police officers comfortable with doing the movements and, and being on the ground and, and dealing with somebody who's bigger, stronger, or even just more resistant. You know, to arrest, most of the time putting a handcuff on somebody you, you go off what's called presumed compliance. That is, I'll tell you to turn around and put your hands behind your back. I expect you to do it, and I'm going to put the handcuffs on you. Rarely do a lot of police officers deal with somebody who says, no, you know, in, in training. In training, we don't, we don't often get to deal with, with somebody that just says, no, I'm, you're not going to handcuff me. And when that happens on the street, now we, we have a bigger problem. You know, now they want to resort to a taser or, you know, drawing a weapon, and now this becomes a big issue. Man, when you see, it's the scariest thing ever um, to see the fear in a police officer or, or hear the fear in a police officer. You can hear that in the, in the struggle, um, especially when the, when the suspect starts going for their weapon. They're just like, oh my goodness, like their worst nightmare has happened. But you can see that this is not, this is not the first time they've thought about this. This is not the first time they've been afraid of this, but it almost feels like the first time it's, they, they've been faced with it actually you know and um weapon retention like you said is uh man that's that's a huge part of it and i i i really hope and i i really do think i feel like it's changing especially with all the video footage everybody's got a camera in their pockets now and everybody's filming police officers like crazy now and so i think that as those videos come out of of police officers struggling to get a drunk guy on the ground or whatever it may be more and more of those videos get circulated on the internet um, people are becoming more aware of, all right, this is a situation that I could come in and I, I could be in. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that floop, 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 two flips and, uh, and, and their legs, yeah. not only are their arms behind their back, but their legs are behind their back and I'm not even having to use my hands, you know, that kind of thing. Like exactly. it's, it's able to be done. It is, it is truly something that can be accomplished. Granted, Absolutely. you're going you're gonna to have to study for a while, but that's okay. It's your job. Do it. You know what I'm saying? All right. I, and I know that I'm I'm on the outside here. I know that I'm not a police officer, so I'm I'm not trying to um, to. It's the same way in that like I should be I should be good at filming because it's my job. Do I should know about cameras, whatever the case may be, you know. But with a police officer, it's like it's much more serious. Everybody's life is on the line. You Absolutely, know? It's a lot more serious than my camera being out of focus. 
is the uh, the police the job of the police officers. And I love the police, and we need the police. So let me always add that into this conversation. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so moving on because I, I don't want to talk out of my rear end here. So I'm, I'm going to let you do some more talking here. You've trained extensively in Filipino, Filipino stick and knife fighting, which yes. I, don't, I don't know what that is, but it sounds terrifying. <laughs> oh, it's, it's absolutely terrifying. Um, yeah, I've been doing that probably, um, since around 1996 or so. I got to train with, uh, a couple of SEAL Team 6s, uh, hand to hand combat instructors. Uh, both, they were also jujitsu guys, real big on it, Muay Thai. And they introduced me to it. And then um, when I moved to Texas and, and, and joined the military, um, I met my first, my, actually my, my, my favorite instructor was actually my first jiu-jitsu instructor. And he was a Filipino knife, uh, stick and knife fighter, judo guy, Muay Thai, a guy named Jerry Smith. He just, uh, he gave me this ima- incredible education on all of it. And he kind of put the love of all of that in my heart, especially the, the Filipino stuff, in, in addition to the jiu-jitsu. And, uh, so he would always educate me on, you know, well, if, cause I wanted to look outside and say, well, what else is there? You know, what other, what other, uh, systems of this is there? What other stuff is there? And he would always educate me on it. And even now I'll, I'll send him videos or ask him about a certain instructor, you know, Jerry, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And, and so from him, um, I'm able to, to branch out and learn more and then kind of sort of come up with my own, uh, my own programs, my own knife defense programs, which, I do for law enforcement as well, you know, how to, how to defend against a knife. And also if you plan on carrying one, you know, on your belt or whatever. Um, so, and it met a lot of uh, fantastic instructors in that art. Do a lot of police officers carry a knife on their belt as well? Yeah, but the ones that I know usually do it for utility purposes, you know, which, you know, uh, to cut, you know, maybe to cut a seat belt or uh, if they need to cut a rope, something like that, you know, uh, that's, that's pretty much the main, uh, the main reason for carrying a knife. But I don't see a, uh, any harm in having that as, as, as a backup if you need it. You never, you never know. But, you know, uh, another, again, important thing to, to know is, is, again, how to defend against, you know, a suspect who now is armed with one. Jiu-Jitsu is an amazing art. But if you try to grapple somebody with a knife, it's going to change dramatically within seconds, you know. Um, and, and so, again, another, another reason to learn not just Jiu-Jitsu, but also um, how to control um, weapons or how to control somebody who's using one against you. Say, say you're a police officer and you haven't done very much, you know, training against a person that's attacking you with a knife. But if you have done a good bit of jujitsu training, you've at least spent a lot of time working on controlling people's appendages so that you can, fo- you can focus on that arm. So, you know, e- even maybe if you haven't spent that time doing that, I, I feel much, I mean, I would obviously be, obviously be terrified and I'd, I'd get stabbed a couple of times. But if it was a person that was, you know, around my size, uh, eventually I, I would be able to control that arm, which is a nice, a nice feeling, you know, um, there are, it's, it's a crazy thing to find out what people do in their lives outside of the jujitsu class. Um, I've been, uh, rolling or sparring or fighting, whatever sparring, I guess is a better term because rolling people outside of the jujitsu community don't really understand rolling. What are you talking about rolling? But (laughs) so I've been sparring with guys before, and um, they're much larger than me, much stronger, much more athletic, and they do not want to be choked by me. And I am choking them out. <laughs> and I found out later, one guy was a firefighter, and the other guy was a SWAT member. Wow. And I am choking them out. And I'm I'm 155 pound, dude. You know, and they do not want to be choked out. Like <laughs> for so many reasons, they're a, they're a human, they're a man, and look at what they do for a living. That's they right. obviously are very, you know. They're, they're rough and tough dudes. Alpha males. Man. Yeah, yeah, most <laughs> definitely. And I'm just like, wow. And granted, as these guys that are bigger and stronger than me, they spend six months going to jujitsu. Now, then, then they catch up to me. And then they're better than me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, which has been a crazy thing to experience. That learning curve of everyone's learning curves goes up and down. And they catch up and you fall behind or whatever the case may be. And uh, so, yeah. It, it's just, just finding that out like who they are outside of their life, it really was eye-opening to say like, wow, yeah, those guys did not want to get choked by me and they got <laughs> choked by me for a little while <laughs> That's at great. least. For a little while at least. That's it. That's awesome. Yeah, and that, that's one of the, the great things about jujitsu is that you can go pretty much full tilt uh, and train it every day and, you know, not 
get brain damage, not scramble your brains or whatever you want to you want to call it. If you were to box and and spar in a in a in a boxing ring all out every single day, uh, in eventually you you'd be speaking a lot more slowly. And That's we correct. see that we see that with professional boxers all the time. They get you know kind of punched. Punch drunk, I think is what yes. they call it. Yeah, which is so sad and uh, and scary and all kinds of stuff. And that's one of the great things about jujitsu. Like I went to jujitsu last night at Lionheart Jujitsu Academy, and um, I I I won a couple times, so to speak, and I lost a couple times, so to speak. And everybody was trying their best, but um, you know, I've got I got a bruise like right here on my arm, and that's that's it. You know, yeah. I, I, it's just that's it, it and I'm, that'll go away in a couple of days, and. That's, you know, I'm good. That's right. By the way, I do want to explain to people that might see me out in public or whatever, all these like splotches and stuff that I have on my arms, I'm not like sick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, uh, I don't, as far as I know, I don't have any kind of like weird terminal skin illness or anything like that. That's just, uh, that's just bruises from jujitsu though. A lot of people think that when you see a, a UFC fight, for example, it's just two guys just doing, you know, just flailing and doing. Mm-hmm. The, but no, we're, we are you and I when we watch a UFC match or a mixed martial arts match, Bellator, you know, Pride, whatever. Um, we are watching those arts being mixed. Literally, that's why it's called mixed martial arts. And you're like, wow, that guy's boxing is much better than this gentleman's, and this guy's kicking is, oh, he better find a way to stop that. And so we are, we it is it is a head game. It's not idiots in a in a in a ring. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Granted, humans are humans, and and people act like idiots uh, all the time. I act like an idiot all the time too. So, and and I think I think the the fighters uh, get a, a bad rap as far as being unintelligent and brutal brutal people but you kind of have to be pretty brutal to to want to do this in the first place but um so that's that's my take on on mixed martial arts but i i I am i am three years into this thing and you are uh, almost a lifetime into this thing so (laughs) i should stop talking so i'm gonna ask you a couple questions so here in this gym i noticed that you have a couple different kinds of heavy bags yes you've got one heavy bag that looks like almost like a cannonball Mm mm-hmm like, um, you know, Miley Cyrus could have done a, a music video <laughs> shoot. She could have done a music video shoot in this gym right here. So you got one that looks like that, and people might look at that and be like, what, is, what in the world is that? And then you've got a, a, a bigger heavy bag that looks like a giant cigar hanging from a chain. <laughs> and uh, and that's, I, I, I take it for a whole different purpose. So talk about the two different uses of a heavy bag, because I, I would... I'm gonna get a heavy bag. I, I want to have one at work where I work and hang one. Um, I've got I got the spot laid out already. Good. <laughs> but I want to know, you know, like how heavy should it be? What kind should I get? What are the different uses? So if you could give me a, give me a primer, he- heavy bags. What to do and and what what what's the, what's the setup? What do I do? Well, um, you need to make sure that you you know have a, a good place to hang it and that, that it's supported. You know, obviously, you might want to get somebody who's pretty good with you know structural, you know, uh, somebody that works construction or whatever, to get the right type of hangers and the right type of support. Whether you're going to hang it to the wall, um, different companies sell uh, different types of stands or different types of wall hangers, um, kind of like what we have up there. Uh, you can attach to the wall and they'll support it. But you got to make sure you know you're on the right studs or whatever. Yeah. Um, and with heavy bags. You just want to make sure you get a good quality one. You know, I mean, there's all different types out there, different companies. Um, I would always try to go with one that's at least 100 pounds. Okay. And when when you have, there's different types of heavy bags. Obviously, the one back here is a six foot tall one. That's more for like the Muay Thai. So this way we can do low leg kicks, mid level kicks, you know, and plus we can also do our boxing training on it. The one that you're talking about, the the Miley Cyrus ball, that's that's uh, <laughs> that's for like doing uppercuts, so that you can specifically get underneath it and, and strike underneath and doing uppercuts and like high level like knee knee strikes, things like that. Yes, um, so it's a, it's a great help with that. So this like the the cannonball one, the Miley Cyrus one, how much does that weigh? Do you know? I'm not sure. I think it's probably around 70 pounds. Okay, and then the full tall, the six foot tall one. Yeah, that one's probably closer to 200. Okay, wow. 150 to 200 because it's yeah six foot tall. So okay, how do you avoid injuries? What what's the right way to approach that? Well, first of all, it's professional training. Yeah. Um, find a boxing gym and and maybe take some introductory classes and have the coach. You know, if if you're um, first of all, I'll show you how to throw the punch correctly and then you know 
they might recommend that you know that you wrap your wrist, that you wrap your hands, and then of course put on a high quality uh, like bag glove or boxing glove. Like a big old fluffy glove, right? Is that what you mean? Either that or, or like the the uh, bag gloves aren't quite that big. Oh, okay. And they usually have like a, a bar across the the middle where, for you to help grip it. Okay. And that'll kind of make your punch just a little bit tighter, and it'll kind of protect your hand a little bit more. What, what you don't want to do, obviously, is start hitting a heavy bag without anything protecting your hand. Okay. You know, obviously, you'll start tearing the skin off. Yeah. And you, there's always the, the risk of hurting your wrist. Most of the people that I see that don't know what they're doing hitting the bag end up snapping their wrist or spraining it really bad. Yeah. So I would definitely find a, a good boxing coach, somebody that knows what they're doing, to show you how to strike the bag first. Yeah. Um, and that'll, that'll help protect you and keep you from getting injured, hopefully. <laughs> Or, or instead of that, you can just put your thumb on the inside. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> if I'd do that. <laughs> that. That might get you hurt. <laughs> but yeah, don't put your thumb on the inside of your, <laughs> your hand, not. folks, and punch anything. <laughs> do not do this. You will, as soon as you punch anything, you're going to break your thumb off. <laughs> That's so, right. So don't do that. <laughs> Brian, thank you so much. I can't, I cannot thank you enough for being on the show. Um, you've been super, super helpful, super awesome. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. You can find Brian at Full Blast Dojo on Facebook. That's Full Blast Dojo on Facebook for all the info. And you can find more episodes of my show and subscribe on YouTube, Facebook, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and by going to www.adler.tv. If you have any feedback or suggestions for future guests and topics, you can drop a comment below. I'll check it out. Thank you so much for your love and support. I love you. I love you. Thanks for checking out the show. I'll see you next Thursday at 5.